Welcome everyone, I'm Madeline DiNono, President and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. With me is our esteemed ASL interpreter, Joe Rivera. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that in Los Angeles, we are currently on the traditional lands of the Gabrielino peoples. I want to recognize that we are all connected with one another and that the ground beneath my feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. So thank you all for joining us today. We are absolutely thrilled to talk about the new feature film from Gravitas Ventures, Mac and Rita, which opens exclusively in theaters nationwide on Friday, August 12th. And if you want to look up where the movie is playing in your neighborhood, go to hashtag Mac A-N-D and Rita movie on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever you look for your information. So I'm extremely privileged that with us today is award-winning actor and director of the film Mac and Rita, Katie Aselton. So welcome, welcome. Oh, hello. So, oh my God. So let's start with how did Pilates bring you <laughs> into this project? Let's start with that. What does Pilates have to do with you getting involved in this movie? Well, Pilates can lead to long lean muscles and a career in filmmaking. Um, so I had the short long story is I had played Diane's daughter in a movie called Book Club. And that movie was directed by a woman named Alex Sachs. She and I uh, were friendly, we stayed friendly, and we ended up going to the same Pilates studio. And one day she walked in and she was like, are you going to direct again? Like, what is the plan? Because there had been a considerate about, amount of time since my last movie. Uh, also, I've got two children and an acting career and the whole thing. But she was like, are you going to direct? And I said, honestly, yeah. yeah. This is, I've decided this is going to be my year. And she goes, that's fantastic because I have your next movie. Um, and it was this, and Diane was already attached. And so she had me take a look at it and I was like, oh my God, I don't know. And she's like, no, I really think I, I believe in you. And Diane said the same thing. And, and here we are. Wow. But it's the same Pilates studio that you see in the movie. We wrote it in. It is. Oh my goodness. That is really, that's really funny. So now let's talk about, uh, you are a multi-hyphenate um actor director obviously this isn't your first go around at the rodeo so what inspired you to become a director and how did you decide to juggle acting directing is it just whichever like tell us a little bit about that yeah you know um I have been acting my entire adult life I left school actually early moved out to Los Angeles and so I've been doing this technically since I was a teenager. And um, with minor success at the beginning, uh, you know, I had had a couple movies at Sundance and, um, but hadn't really hit anything big aside from like our big Sundance breakout, the puppy chair. Um, and it had been one like very bad pilot season where I had auditioned for a ton of things and and tested for three great shows and didn't book anything and I was like whatever I'm gonna have a kid let's <laughs> just if we're not gonna make a tv show let's make a kid so I had my first child and like six months in I was like I need to get back to work I love what I do I miss it I miss it so much so I looked at my husband who's Mark Duplass he's a filmmaker and an actor in his own love right love him love him me too um and I said would you please write me a role and he said I think you should write yourself a role and you know you're a storyteller like go go make a movie you can do this and so I did and that was how I got into directing and it um you know it's become sort of my joke that it's like my fallback career my mom was always like Katie you got to do something you don't know if this acting thing's gonna work out and uh so I was like fine mom I'll direct <laughs> How's that? Well, and and it's working for you. Yeah, so I love it. And it turns out it's like it is such um a 
a really fantastic extension of acting in that way. And I love coming to directing as an actor because it is, I'm so performance-based and performance-driven. Um, and the collaborative act of filmmaking just as a whole is so exciting to me. So um, it's something that I never imagined for myself and yet feels so incredibly natural. I really do love doing it. Well, it does come natural to you. And when you're talking about collaboration, let's talk about your collaboration with Diane Keaton, which preceded this movie. But when you think about breaking down a script and blocking and tackling, there is a lot of uh, physical comedy. It's one thing to be funny. It's another thing to be good at physical comedy. So knowing that you had a previous relationship with Diane Keaton, how did the two of you come together to kind of walk through the script and think about the beats and think about how you wanted to direct her, how she wanted to be directed and how she didn't kill herself. I know. Doing some of this physical, <laughs> uh, real physical stuff. Well, it's so funny that you say that because the, the physical gags in this and the physical comedy in this movie were, imperative like you really needed it and and Diane was like and we need more of it she was like you know as we were doing different drafts of the script she was like there needs to be more physical comedy more physical comedy more physical like so before you know it I'm flipping her upside down and on and on, it was an inversion table and throwing her on like this balance skateboard thing that sends it right out from underneath her and then I mean obviously the Pilates reformer you know, getting her up on those boxes, like spying in the thing. There was, she was really adamant about just pushing for more, more, more. She totally got it. And the woman was incredibly game for everything. It was like, Diane, today I'm going to flip you upside down on this table. Okay, let's go. Truly. I, I was waiting for outtakes. I, mean, uh, I don't know if you're going to build those in um, at the end, but... Uh, <laughs> What you'll see is me mostly like in the background being like, oh God, <laughs> oh, please don't hurt her. Oh God, oh, stop. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. It was a Oh lot my, well, it really, it just comes, comes across so authentically. Um, and, uh, and it's fabulous to see that aspect of her, which as a dramatic actor, as a comedic actor, I don't recall seeing so much physical comedy in another film. Maybe there was, but I, to me, I thought I'm seeing a different side. Um, yeah, you know, uh, where I, you know, I, I agree with you. I think okay. um, I thought back a lot to Baby Boo for her and the energy I wanted for this character was very similar to what she brought in Baby Boom and the physicality that she brought. If you go back and that, watch that movie, which it 100% holds up. That movie is fantastic. Um, but it was really like, she does, she has this, and I think we see it on a lot of different levels in a lot of her different performances, but there is a quirk and a youthful um, vivaciousness. And some of that comes through physically. And then a lot of it comes through, I think, emotionally in her performances. Um, but my God, when she does, when she harnesses it physically, it's really fun to watch. So much fun. So let's talk about uh, the rest of the cast. Um, oh my God. So first of all, a lot of pressure for Elizabeth Lale to step in because that's the first thing you see. And what I noticed was I felt that she embodied a lot of the cadence of mm -hmm. Diane Keaton. So it wasn't a disconnect or disrupt her then transitioning, you know, into, into Rita. So it seemed like it was very strategic and also um, very authentic. Can you, can you talk about that process for Elizabeth Absolutely. and connecting you know, with Diane and then, you know, into the Rita, you know, the Mac and the Rita of it. I, I mean, it's a real credit to Elizabeth Lale and what she's capable of doing. I think she is a beautiful, beautiful actress, but what she did from, from the very first moment of even in her audition is that she was never doing an impression of Diane. She really did just sort of absorb 
her qualities and you'd see little, little tiny physicalities, little tiny movements, little ways that she would speak or laugh. Um, and it's so interesting because, you know, she's a theatrically trained actress who, who is very, very studied. And Diane is a very instinctual, like um, moves from the guts, but the two of them really, I do think like shares a very similar wavelength just on a personal level. Um, so it wasn't a huge leap for, for Elizabeth to, to do that. But um, I agree with you. I think she did it quite beautifully. I think she really did. And then let's talk about this all-star cast, OMG. So uh, Loretta Devine, oh my goodness, how did she get into this project? She added, uh, stole every scene she was in, but just added so much depth and nuance. I could watch Loretta and Diane go at each other. I mean, they truly, I wish they had their own reality show. Did the they know of, each other? No, they never met. And my God, they just, I mean, Loretta takes no shit from anyone. Like Loretta really embodies Sharon in that way, but she's also like the most polite, but she all, it is just fantastic. So I think where a lot of people are intimidated by Diane, Loretta was not. Loretta just like went toe to toe with her and it they were so much fun to watch. And, and she was truly uh, just a real gem on set. My God, what a force, a real, real force. So when it came to their interaction, how strict were you on following the script versus the scene and letting it rip? Like, did you allow for that? Absolutely, absolutely. I really, I love improvisation. So whenever an actor is comfortable enough to sort of take the script into their own hands and, and make it better, Sometimes it's not, sometimes they're making it worse, but whenever it's going to improve a scene, I love it. I'm very open to it. And, and certainly even just not even improvise, but loosen it up enough just to make the dialogue really natural. I think that's what helps with these scenes. And it's why you feel connected to these characters because, because they are, the dialogue is all very comfortable. No one feels like they're forced fed a, a line, you know? I mean, I felt like I was, watching a party, um, you know, happening. So also when we look at chemistry, can you talk about the chemistry between Elizabeth Lale and Taylor Page? Because honestly, they acted like they grew up as kids. I know. To me, it was a very authentic, you know, relationship. You know, we got very, very lucky with the casting across the board on this movie. Um, we had to cast everything over Zoom. So I never, no one had a chemistry read. Elizabeth met Diane on set. Um, they, uh, sorry, I just got a very strange message on my computer that's on a do not disturb setting. Um, they, they, they really, everyone met on their, whatever their first day was with each other. So it really, again, speaks to the incredible nature of, of each one of these actresses and, and actors who just came and brought it. And we're, we're so open. And I also, it was just, it was a real joyful set. So I think you really sort of feel that in the dynamics between the characters. I think it sort of comes through on set, but we were just having like a really fun time. And was there real wine? Because just for everyone who's not as familiar, there are some amazing, wine club group scenes with you know amy hill and you know lois smith who gina had the privilege of working with wendy malick you know amy carrero i mean it's just patty harrison no I mean, it real just wine goes on and on and on like i i'd be scared to walk <laughs> into that room with those gals and say okay let's ad lib but let's not let it get out of control so how did you rein that in uh, look, I wish we had real wine flowing, but we did not. So it was all very professional. And, you know, the hardest thing in those big group scenes is it is it does get very like boisterous and everyone starts overlapping. But when that's working and you have two cameras, like if you can capture it, then you've just got gold. So you just it look really, really shows so there to me are some very poignant you know, themes. And I love in the beginning of the movie 
where Grammy Martin says, life goes fast enough as it is. Mm -hmm. And the theme of, you know, Elizabeth um, and the Mac and Rita saying, not being enough. And I think all of us have that sense of I'm an imposter. And mm -hmm. so can you talk about the themes um, that were brought out by the brilliant um, writing of Paul Welsh and, and Madeline Walter and all of you and how, you know, there's a sincerity um, and a depth to these themes that are really relevant for all of us. Yeah, I agree. I, it's what really drew me to the script in the first place, because I, I agree with you. I think we are all feeling a bit of, of an imposter syndrome and feeling like we're maybe shoehorning ourselves into a mold that like wasn't made for us. And we look at these older women, in particular, older people in our society, and and look at these people who who seem to have their lives together and have learned how to set boundaries and learn to accept who they are and there is an ease and a comfort that comes with that and a confidence that is aspirational and i think the fun thing that this movie sort of poses to the audience is like what if we adopt that way of thinking earlier like what if we could love who we are and accept who we are um in our 20s, in our 30s? Like what would the rest of our life look like then if we stopped trying to fit something that society is saying is like the ideal, you know? Or like heed to the pressures of, of what we're supposed to be doing for our career, for our friendships, our relationships. You know, it's like, there's so many screens telling us like what, these are the tips you know, these are these, this is the checklist of how you get to this point. And it's like, it's exhausting. And so you do look at someone like Grammy Martin or like Loretta's character or Lois Smith's character. And you're like, oh, I want that sense of self. I want that sense of like groundedness and my God, it must only come with age, but, but it doesn't, it comes with self-acceptance and self-love, I think. And what I think you also do really well is turning aging upside down on its head. And, um, you know, a lot of the scenes um, with uh, the character, you know, of Jack played by the phenomenal, you know, Dustin Milligan, you know, that's really flipping it. You know, we've seen um, a lot of movies, you know, where it's always the older man and the younger gal, but, you know, this is a different scenario where, um, it's turning aging on its head from the standpoint of romance, from the standpoint of what you can do. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about the theme of kind of counter aging um, yeah. that you were able to bring out, but not in a way that was like so on the nose. Well, good. <laughs> um, yeah, look, let's let's find a way to blow it all up, right? Like we're all on the same path at different stops along the line, you know? So Who's to say, why does it, why does the fun have to stop? And why do we have to stop like exploring our, our bliss, you know, because we are of a certain age, like this of a certain age idea is kind of like full of baloney, really, you know, look, there are plenty of people, myself included, who are married and settled, but my gosh, for all of the single people out there, why on earth would you like limit your heart to what you're you're societally supposed to be doing, you know? And then can you talk about, um, because this is something we all confront, the whole social media influencer, you know, kind of like story arc about that. I thought it was, you know, hilarious, but we're all struggling with it. Yeah, I think particularly now, I think the fun thing about the character of Mac and her like level of influencer is like, she is kind of the most common kind of influencer that is like not that successful at it, but it does bring in a little extra cash to like supplement her writing situation. But like she's like sponsored by green goo hand sanitizer. You know, it's like she's not getting like the big Charlotte Tilbury packages in the mail. She's getting like very sort of crappy little sponsored post offers. Um, and it's more common than you even realize, like you look at your social media and you're like, oh, is my cousin hawking a lip gloss right now? 
because she is, <laughs> you know? Um, so it is funny, I think, I think, you know, the big Hollywood movie would probably have like an Eva Chen type character who is a very successful influencer. But I think the funnier thing to play with is just because it is so, I mean, pervasive social media and influencing and everything that it's no longer like the big contracts. Like now there are just people who are just sort of dabbling in it on a very amateur level. Well, it's those scenes are also, you know, really hilarious. I don't want to give too much away. So I know we're almost at time, but I'd love for you to tell our audiences, you know, what do you want them to take away, you know, from the film or what were some of your, you know, most favorite moments? Oh, uh, you know, I hope, I really hope they leave the movie with a sense of, of hope and, and connection. I think that the cool thing about this movie that I've found is so many people really do connect to this idea of like, of God, I, I'm like Mac. I am always the grandmother in my group. I'm always the one who like wants to go home early. And I think it can be connected to this trend of like cottage core and coastal grandmother. And I think like we're sort of embracing the idea of comfort and coziness and self care and learning to to set our boundaries a lot earlier maybe than grammy martin did or sharon or betty or um and so i i hope that audiences leave with like maybe just a little bit more inspired to be who they are and and love who that person is and like what if we all just were rita a lot early in our lives like let's just embrace our own inner rita I feel well, like the world would be so much more interesting if we did. And I think also one of my takeaways is that you are enough. You Absolutely. are enough. Absolutely. And I think that's such a great uh, message, especially considering the kind of environment that we've all been living with for the past few years. So everyone, your homework assignment, August 12th, hit the theaters. Well, actually before then, find out where the theater is, playing by you, then go to the theater. And then talk about it on social media. I know we are. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Joe, thank you um, as always. And uh, we wish you the best of luck with the film. We think it's going to be a smash hit. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone.